Southern California, good evening and welcome to another edition of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. We have ourselves a jam-packed show for you all as we have a lot of Southern California sports to get into, such as the LA Rams. How about the Rams dethroning Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in a pretty close game? They almost relinquished it, but hey, close wins are victories quite the same. Now they take on their divisional foe, the 49ers, in the NFC Championship. And Anthony Davis has returned for the Lakers, but can he make a big impact for the Lakers going forward? And how about UCLA men's basketball upsetting number three, Arizona? Now the Pac-12 gets interesting as not only the Bruins benefit from this, but USC kind of benefits from this as they played Stanford as the show is going on. All that and more here on the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. This is Taryn Rodriguez bringing you another edition of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show here on iSports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. And welcome one, welcome all to another edition of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Thank you for joining me on this beautiful Thursday afternoon. I got some explaining to do. So first of all, this was kind of the only day for me to do the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Because tomorrow I'm booked for work and I'm going to Long Beach State for their men's volleyball match. And to have the meet and greet with Tyler Hildebrand, the new Long Beach State women's volleyball head coach. And then Saturday, I'm booked because I've got College Edition with Larry B. Then I've got other things I have to do. And then I've also got Long Beach State, Penn State for men's volleyball as well. So, yeah, this was kind of the only time I was going to be able to do the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. And I didn't want to miss it just because, obviously, it would have been bad because... It's the NFC Championship, and the Rams are in it. But before we get on into the Rams, we have to go over our sponsors. The first sponsor for IE Sports Radio is the Southern California Warriors semi-pro football team. The world of semi-pro sports is unlike any other sports organization. Players pay to play in hopes of so many different outcomes, whether it's playing to get filmed to trap for professional teams, big-time colleges, or just playing to stay in shape. No matter what, all semi-pro players have one thing in common, and that's playing for the love of the game. The SoCal Warriors have been on a quest to earn titles and give players second chances since 2017. Whether you're in Southern California or anywhere in the world, give semi-pro sports a chance if you love your sport. You may get the second chance you've been waiting for as an athlete. You can find them on social media at SoCal Warriors via Twitter, at Southern California underscore Warriors on Instagram, and Southern California Warriors on Facebook. The second sponsor for iSports Radio is Background Check International Businesses. Are you looking to background check a new hire on? Let Kit Fremen take care of that for you. Kit has founded and managed Background Check International Businesses since 2000, or 1994, and he's here to help you with the screening process. Considering new hires are always important to have background checks, this is the guy you want to go to, Kit Fremen. Contact him and help. let him help make the hiring process that much easier. 
This business is used for professional background checks and not for the use of any crimes such as identity theft or other illegal activity. They do not have Twitter or Instagram, but they do have the Book of Faces, a.k.a. Facebook, as you can find them at backgroundcheckinternational-bci. They also have their website, www.bcint.com. And IE Sports Radio is on Twitter and on Instagram, at IE Sports Radio. And Facebook by typing the word IE, then sports, then radio. And then you, they also have a website, www.iesportsradio.com. And when you go there, they have a Patreon link with five different tiers. The first one starting out at $5 a month, which gets you a shout-out from all 29 of our shows. Higher tiers include iSports Radio merchandise, access to IESRU, the podcasting university of iSports Radio, and even a chance to be featured on The Defining Moment with Larry B. in a segment. And that show is actually the flagship show of iSports Radio because for the last seven and a half years, iSports Radio has been bringing you amazing content ranging from in from interviewing legendary athletes, coaches, and other authorized media personnel, to building tailor-made shows dedicated to all major sports cities and regions in this country. All the while, iSports Radio has continued to be by the fans and for the fans, and with your help, we are ready to take the next biggest step. Thank you all for continuing to support iSports Radio and making it your direct feed for all the sports. And the iSports Radio Fan of the Month is Steeler Jim, whose Twitter is at Steel4364426 Go, as he is a diehard Steelers fan, and I'm 95% certain he's devastated by the news of Ben Roethlisberger retiring, but Ben Roethlisberger had an amazing career and Steeler Jim is definitely happy about how Ben will be riding off into the sunset. Also have to give a shout to Bay Area Race Apparel and Marcus Lilsgrate for being our Patreon supporters. So thank you to those two for helping keep the lights on. Alright, now let's get on into the Southern California sports action. So we definitely gotta start off with the Rams as well they had themselves quite the interesting NFC divisional round matchup against Tampa Bay. So early on, it looked as if this game was going to be a complete blowout as the Rams led 20 to three. I was very surprised to see them get in the, a beat down on Tampa Bay considering you obviously can never bet against Tom Brady. And I was told specifically not to bet against Tom Brady, but instead I decided to do so because I am that guy. Anyway, so the Rams actually went up 27-3, to and then I was like, no way. It's not going to happen. It's not 28-3. to Like, there's no way Tom Brady and the Bucks can come back. Uh, I kind of spoke a little too soon because... The Bucks were chipping away at the lead, partially because the Rams had turnovers. Like, they kept fumbling the ball. Like, for instance, at the end of the second quarter, Cam Akers actually fumbled the ball. And it was kind of an unfortunate bounce. Like, I don't think he knew he fumbled it. And I thought he felt that the play was whistled dead. And unfortunately, it was a turnover. And that could have made it a possible... 23 or 27, I'm sorry, not 23, 27, 20 to 24 point lead game for the Rams going into halftime. And they got the ball to start the second half. Unfortunately, that was not the case. And then also Cooper Cup fumbled, which was a little uncharacteristic by him after Tampa Bay got the touchdown which was their first touchdown of the day. And then Ryan Suckup got the field goal. And then the Rams were were just unable to get their offense going. And I'm like, oh gosh, why is this happening? And eventually the Rams did get a turnover as Vaughn Miller forced a fumble. But then the Rams turned it over back, sadly, as... This isn't even Matt Stafford's fault. Like, the the long snapper snapped it before Stafford can 
signal for the ball, and then it eventually was a turnover, and I think that's le- that's what led to the Ryan suck-up field goal. Then the Rams were able they, – they had to go three and out, and eventually they forced the Bucks to turn it over on downs. And then unfortunately, I want to say it was that they, they went three and out as well, and then – the Bucks were able to score on their next drive as Tom Brady found Mike Evans. So it was the second to last offensive drive for the Rams. And excuse me. So and all they needed to do was get a first down. The Bucks were fresh out of timeouts, and if the Rams got a first down, it was game over. So it looked as if Cam Akers was about to get the first down, but then he fumbles the ball again. So it's like, oh my gosh. It's like, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It felt like I was watching the Chargers. It's like, bruh. Like, the Rams making bonehead mistakes is very uncharacteristic. And I think they really eased up despite building a sizable lead. So then eventually, Tom Brady does Tom Brady magic. He eventually gets the Ram- or the, he gets the Bucks into the Rams' red zone, and then Leonard Fournette goes in for a touchdown. It's suddenly twenty seven twenty seven, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is just I I'm so distraught. And then, to everyone's amusement, Matt Stafford did not crumble under pressure as he launched a deep ball, found Cooper Cup as he, I think he went down to like the 10-yard line, maybe the 90-yard line, and then the Rams obviously did not have any timeouts, and then Matt Stafford spiked the ball. He almost turned it over as he actually went for a quarterback keeper up the middle, and he actually lost the ball momentarily, and I'm just wondering, why are the, the Rams doing that? Did they not learn what happened with the Cowboys against the Niners? So back to Stafford's amazing throw. He threw the ball down to Cooper Cup. He went down to the nine. And then eventually the Rams brought in Matt Gay, who actually missed a field goal. That was one of the plays that happened. So Matt Gay actually missed like a 47-yard field goal. It was just a little bit short as this time Matt Gay had to kick a 30-yard field goal. And keep in mind that Matt Gay was the former Bucks kicker. So eventually... Matt Gay made the 30-yard field goal, and that was that. The Rams were able to defeat the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and advance to the NFC Championship. So I think if you list, if you all listen to this clip, you're going to hear something very familiar that may ring a bell to some of y'all. Oh, wait. That was a fail. I've I put a lot of deep thought into this, and... I think the Rams are going to win. I think the Rams will just eke out a win. There's no way they win by 10 points like they did the first meeting. I'm going to say the Rams win 31-28. As cheesy of a score as that sounds, I think it sounds like the most logical. I think the Rams keep the ball in the hands of Matt Stafford all the way to the end, and then Matt Gay hits the game-winning field goal. And I think it would be fitting that Matt Gay would win the the game. So, yeah, that was my prediction last week, and boy, howdy, did it come true. The final score was not accurate, I will admit that, but I pretty much called it pretty much perfectly. So, yeah. So, good job to the Rams, even though they made that a lot stressful for the Rams fans than it needed to, so, yeah, I was actually quite worried that the Rams were actually going to choke this one, so, good, good, good job, Rams, I, I was actually quite impressed, so, the Rams move on to the NFC Championship for the second time in four seasons, as they take on a familiar foe, the San Francisco 49ers, Ooh, baby. That has been that was probably the team that the Rams probably match up against, match up well against the least. So for the Rams, they are really going to have their work cut out for them. So 
let's talk about the Niners. So the Niners eked out a win against the Green Bay Packers, and I'm going to be honest, I didn't think they would actually beat the Packers. However, they were able to pull out the win, and I was darn right impressed. Winning at Lambeau Field, quite impressive. Now, something I did not know was that I did not know Aaron Rodgers was 0-4, well, 0-3 going into that game against the Niners in the postseason. Like, I totally forgot the Niners had Aaron Rodgers' number in the postseason. I I thought he at least got a win, but that's that's rather astounding. And now Aaron Rodgers is 0-4 against the Niners going in when it comes to playing in the postseason. And I was very disappointed in the Packers. They only put up 10 points. They only had one offensive touchdown. And more importantly, their special teams was not so special. It looked as if I was watching the Chargers because, case in point, both teams' special teams are less than special. But I was very impressed by the Niners. They didn't even score one offensive touchdown and they were able to win that game. It is very impressive. They got a field goal from Robbie Gould. Then they got a defensive touchdown as it was a block field goal. And then Talanoa Hufanga, the former USC defensive standout, ran it in for a touchdown. And then Robbie Gould kicked the game-winning field goal. And that was that. Bye-bye, Aaron Rodgers and Packers. So... Yeah, it was basically that right there for the Niners as the Niners will be playing the Rams at SoFi Stadium. I'm just going to also say this about the Rams and Niners. It's going to be a great matchup, but can we please stop making a huge deal about Niners fans taking over Levi, or not Levi Stadium, uh, SoFi. First of all, games are won on the field and not in the stands. Like, you could ask the Chargers. Like, they have to deal with Raiders fans swarming SoFi whenever they play at SoFi. Second of all, I think the Rams will be ready. Everyone says the the Niners own the Rams, or Lambs as they call them. But I think this is the time that the Rams step up. Now, you look at the two meetings this year. So the first meeting, the Rams got stomped on against the Niners. The second meeting, the Rams actually led 17-0, and they eventually collapsed, which was a downright disgrace. For me, I thought the Rams looked better in that second game, obviously, and they had that game won. The problem was they made one too many mistakes. They could not stop the Niners' final drive, and Matt Stafford made two turnovers. He had two interceptions. The other being one coming off, one being the game win, the the game stealing interception, which eventually helped the Niners get into the playoffs. So for me, I think this is the time for the for the Rams to step up. Something about Matt Stafford that has been quite unique is that they have not he has not had a turnover in the postseason, and we are not counting the turnover that the the snapper had in the Tampa Bay game because that was not all his fault that was on the snapper who who er, who early snapped it so for me i think the rams they ha- they know what to do in terms of stopping the niners they have to play a full four quarters like they have to 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 like there's no there's no exception. Like this is basically the championship game in the NFC. This is for a spot in the big dance or, or in the Super Bowl. So So for me the Rams keys to victory are they have to protect Matt Stafford. Matt Stafford has to not turn the ball over and more importantly the Rams need to keep their foot on the gas. If they could put keep their foot on the gas, they're golden. I honestly think they should have won that second matchup. And to be honest, I think those. I think that late field goal kind of 
kept the Niners in the game, and it basically gave them a spark going into halftime. It kind of reminded me of the Chargers-Saints game from last year, except the Saints got a touchdown instead of a, a field goal. But regardless, both those teams managed to rally back from 17-point deficits. And both actually managed to win in overtime, ironically enough. So for the Rams, again, it's basically defense has to put pressure on on Jimmy G. The offense, offensive line has to protect Matt Stafford. And the Rams as a whole can't turn the ball over. Like Stafford has been phenomenal when it comes to not turning the ball over this postseason. But everyone else kind of needs to lay off on the turnovers. Like, Cam Akers cannot have two turnovers. The snapper cannot have too much. They, he cannot do that sort of thing, mishandle the snap or pre-snap it. And then Cooper Cup cannot fumble the ball like he did. So if the Rams basically play clean football, they don't do anything silly, they don't get cute and fancy – I think they win. Now, their run defense is really going to have to step up because that's what gashed them the most in the previous meeting. And if the Rams don't do that, then they're going to get ran over like the Raiders did against the Chargers in Week 18. So, for me, the Rams do have what it takes on paper, but now they have to show it in this stage. And... The Rams have done so well, and I give credit to Matt Stafford. Everyone thought he was going to crumble under pressure. Everyone thought he was going to lose in the first round or the wild card round. But for me, I think Matt Stafford has done a fantastic job. There's a reason why he was third in the league in passing yards. And even though he had five more turnovers than Jimmy Garoppolo, he's cleaned it up in the postseason. So I think for me... This is his time to shine, and he's pretty much in his early 30s. Like, it's not going to get any better for him. Like, this is kind of his window to try to get a Super Bowl. So, we'll see what happens. Um, Something I will say about the Niners versus the Rams is that I got one person saying the Niners' wins have been more impressive than the Rams' wins. No. No. First of all, I understand the Niners had that great victory over the Rams in Week 18. I understand that. But the Rams, or I'm sorry, the Niners barely beat a Cowboys team who decided to make one of the worst plays at the end of the game. It was very, very frustrating. It's like, how are you going to justify that? It's like the Cowboys are basically Peyton Manning without the rings They're basically great in the regular season, but trash in the postseason. So, and then you also have have to remember that Jimmy G did not play his best against the Packers. Like, he did enough to win, but he wasn't flashy. Like, the Niners probably could have won by 10 or more. So, and then you obviously, and then you have to look at the Rams. Obviously, that loss in Week 18 hurt, but I think. The Rams, when it came to that game, they knew they had a playoff spot locked up, but they just didn't want to, like, get serious about it. Like, I think they weren't serious enough. I didn't think they played to their full potential, and I think they went a little conservative in that second half. They went too cute after they went up 17 nothing, and I think they just need to play a safer, cleaner game. And then looking at the Rams' playoff wins, the Cardinals are a good win. I don't care what anyone says. The Cardinals are a solid team. And everyone says that the Cardinals were overrated, overhyped, and they were disappointing. Eh, not really. I mean, the Cardinals eventually had the number one seed, and then injuries happened, and then everything else happened, and then the collapses happened. And then, obviously, the win over the Bucks That was impressive. Like, on the road against Tom Brady, it's never, ever easy to beat Tom Brady. Like, if you can go on the road and beat Tom Brady, you get a cookie. 
So for the Rams, I don't agree with what this one person said, saying the Rams' wins have not been impressive than the Niners. I think it's a not the best claim to say. I'm not going to say it's a dumb claim, but I think for me it could have been a little bit better. I think you 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 can't really like use that claim all that much, especially when the Niners' wins have been by one score. All well, their last few wins have been by one score. So, and then they also got, got to remember that in Week 17, the Ram or the Niners beat a donkey do Texans team. Like for me, as long as Matt Stafford takes care of the ball and he doesn't cost his team the game. The Rams are solid. But if he turns the ball over at least twice, then the Rams are done. The Rams are done. They're not going to win. And, yeah. And also, can I just say, I don't think, once again, I don't think the Rams care that if it's going to be full of Niners fans. Like, if it's full of Niners fans, cool. But, again, games are won on the field instead of in the stands. Justin Herbert pretty much elated to this when the Chargers played the Cowboys and the and the Raiders. And then also, if the Rams have to go with a silent snap count, so be it. So, honestly, yeah. I think the Rams get it done. I think they finally get over the hump against the Niners. I think when the chips are all down and when there's when the season's on the line and when it truly matters the most, I think the Niners are not going to have enough in the tank. I think the Rams will have just a little bit more to beat the Niners. I'm going to say the Rams win 31-21. I originally said it was going to be 38-28, but I think it's a little too high scoring. I think the Rams will do just enough to get that extra field goal to put them up 10 instead of like 7. And then I think the Rams will be able to finish out the game. It's not going to be easy to take down the Niners just because they have a great defense. Jimmy Garoppolo has found the formula. Debo Samuel has been amazing. George Kittle is a freaking beast. And the Niners have been making it happen. Like They went from nearly missing the playoffs to being two wins away from winning the Super Bowl. And that's darn impressive right there. So I think for me, it's going to be a barn burner. And this basically comes down to who turns the ball over less. So there's my little assessment for the Rams and the Niners. I should also make note that both of these teams are actually going to play the Chargers next week. The Chargers will be hitting the road to Levi Stadium next year when they play the Niners, and then they'll play the Rams in a home game. I say the word home a little bit loosely just because, well, it's also the home for the Rams. But regardless... It's going to be a fun little matchup. I, I know it's a little early to look at the Chargers, and they're out of the playoffs, so yeah. We'll leave that alone until next year. So, But we're counting on you, Rams. You're kind of our last hope when it comes to major Southern California teams in the postseason. Bring us home that championship, or at least represent the NFC. Just make sure you find a way to beat NorCal. Just please, please. Okay, I digress. So now let's jump on in to some hockey action. So the Ducks have kind of been on a tear, actually. They've kind of actually been playing better, which is surprising because they haven't been really looking all that great. So last Friday, they defeated the Tampa Bay Lightning 5-1, to which was darn right impressive. I didn't think the Ducks had it in them against a Tampa Bay team and with them struggling, having lost three in a row, and having barely beaten the Red Wings. I thought the Ducks were going to lay an egg, but they were able to take down the Lightning. It would have been even better if that was a road game, but it's still darn right an impressive win. And then the Ducks followed that up with an impressive win over the Boston Bruins on the road, beating them 5-3, to three, and 
my goodness. Again, it, that's another not-so-favorable matchup for the Ducks. But they made that look easy. So bravo to the Ducks winning back-to-back tough games. Unfortunately, their luck kind of stopped as they lost to the Toronto Maple Leafs yesterday, 4-3. to I will say this about the Ducks that game. They were down 3-1 after the first period. They got a goal back in the second period. Then they scored the equalizer in the third period. And Jonathan... And then Gibby, Jonathan Gibson, was doing phenomenal things in the net, which was darn right impressive. Unfortunately, and this is a big, unfortunately, or John Gibson, not Jonathan Gibson, but you know what I mean. Unfortunately, Gibby just didn't have enough in the tank in the shootout, which was kind of sad. But I liked how the Ducks did credit Gibby for his amazing saves, and he was the reason why they got him that point. And I'm darn right impressed that the Ducks were able to nearly come back from a 3-1 deficit to win the game. So, good on you, Ducks. Good effort. At least you got a point. And then tonight, the Ducks beat the Canadians, the Montreal Canadiens, 5-4 as... The Ducks actually got the early jump as they led 3 to nothing after the first period. I was very impressed. Like, they were flashy, and they basically just got the early jump on them. And then Montreal, to their credit, did try to make it closer, but then the Ducks had an answer for them. Then in the third period, it kind of almost went awry as Montreal scored in the early parts of the quarter, and then they scored with about less than six minutes to go in the third quarter. And to the Ducks' credit, they were able to prevent the Canadians from scoring again. So good for the Ducks. They ended the road trip quite nice. Well, actually, no, they're still on their road trip as they play the Ottawa Senators on Saturday, and then they play the Detroit Red Wings on the road on Monday. And then the Ducks will return home to take on the Seattle Kraken on Friday. So, good stuff. And, actually, they don't return this next Friday to take on the Kraken. They actually have a break in between. So, I think that's the all-star break. So, there's that right there. So, for the Ducks, they are only one point behind the Vegas Golden Knights, which is quite impressive. Very impressive. And, I'm glad to see they're actually back on track, especially since last week was such a wash. But right behind those Ducks are those pesky LA Kings, which is quite nice. They're still having a phenomenal year. They have had a lot of close calls, but they are still looking good. And tonight on ESPN Plus Hockey Night, they were able to they were able to get the win over the New York Islanders, winning three to two, which was quite nice. Good victory, especially on the road. So, yeah, it's not a bad victory in the slightest. Anytime you get a victory, it's a good victory. So, I think for me, the Kings are still on the up and up. And there was actually history made when it came to the LA Kings tonight as the Drew Daughtry played his 1,000th NHL games tonight. So great job to Drew Daughtry. I did not know that. I kind of slightly forgot, but then I was re reminded. And then shout out to Adam Karnick and the Neutral Zone Twitter account or Zachary Puplis as they basically reminded me. I'm like, oh my goodness, I did not know this. As we say hello to Larry B, he says, SoCal is the show, Cal. Larry says the Ducks piss him off. I don't know if I'm allowed to say piss on the air without the explicit tag, but I don't know. The Ducks won two impossible games, and then they won tonight, and they're only one point back of the Golden Knights. So they're, I have been on this train saying the Ducks are the most hot and cold team ever. Eh. <laughs> so Larry says... The Kings are stupid. (laughs) He says the Kings need to go back to Atlanta and take the Clippers with them. (laughs) Oh, Larry. (laughs) 
that's pretty funny right there. So thanks for popping in the chat room, Larry. So as for the Kings, before I lose my mind about seeing Larry's amazing comments, so they actually were able to split their previous two games before they took on the Islanders as they lost to the Rangers on Monday in a shootout three to two, which was sad stuff, but they beat the New Jersey Devils three to two, which salvages a two and or two and one record as they last played last Thursday against the Avalanche and got hailed on four to one. I would say rained on, but it's not rain. As that that win over the Devils actually snapped a three-game losing skid for the Kings. So the Kings kind of needed to win that game in the worst way. So since there is no Grammy road trip, or there's no Grammys, we can't really call this the Grammy road trip. So we basically just have to call it the road trip. As the Kings, this Saturday, they hit the road to the city of brotherly love to take on the Philadelphia Flyers. Then on Sunday, the Kings head further up east to take on the Pittsburgh Penguins. It's going to be a fun little matchup, especially facing Dustin Brown. And then on Wednesday, the Kings close out their road trip against the Detroit Red Wings. So nice stuff right there for the Kings. They are only two points back of the Ducks, as they are also four points ahead of San Jose and Calgary. So good good going good going you two and if we do get to see them in the postseason that would be fun and i think either of those two can dethrone the vegas golden knights i know vegas is probably one of the more supreme teams but they haven't really been all that supreme and they're only one point ahead of anaheim so good good going so now we jump on over to the NBA. So uh, kind of the more, I wouldn't call it the more depressing portion of the show, but it's time for some Lakers Clippers talk. So for the Lakers, they got some good news. Anthony Davis is back, baby. <laughs> nice. Which is awesome. He actually made a great impact in the Lakers win over the Brooklyn Nets on Tuesday, winning 106-96. to Even though he was minus one in the plus-minus category, Anthony Davis had himself four blocks and he had eight points. He was able to help out LeBron, even though LeBron pretty much did the grunt work. Tonight, however, was a different story as LeBron did not play because of knee soreness as the Philadelphia 76ers beat the Lakers 105-87, to which really made me sad. I was not thrilled. It's like, blech. But the Sixers are good. And then on Sunday, this past Sunday, the Lakers lost to the Miami Heat 113-107. I kind of figured the Lakers were kind of going to struggle against the Heat, considering the Heat are good. And then last Friday, even though I announced this on the air, the Lakers beat the Orlando Magic 116 to 105. As honestly, everyone is saying that Frank Vogel's job is in jeopardy, but fire as Marcus Los Great said in the chat room last week, mar- firing Frank Vogel is not going to make the Lakers better. The Lakers have a bunch of old players and they are getting hurt. They don't hustle back. They don't play defense. It's disgusting. So stop saying it's all Frank Vogel's fault. And who are the Lakers going to replace him with? Like, Fizdale? Uh, Larry says, the Lakers make me want to throw a pizza at my TV. And he's, <laughs> Larry says his sanity is in jeopardy. You and mine both, buddy. Uh the Lakers do need to get healthy ASAP. But in other positive Laker news, outside of AD coming back, the Lakers have signed Stanley Johnson, a Southern California product, to a two-year contract. And I'm happy they gave Stanley Johnson a contract, not just because he is a Southern California product, but the dude has been working hard ever since he got multiple 10-day contracts. And I hope Stanley Johnson does 
keep it going with the Lakers. He's actually a former modern day player as he helped modern day go 34 and 0 back in the 2014 season. I think it was 2013, 2014 season as it was quite the incredible season for Gary McKnight and the Monarchs. So good on Stanley Johnson. I was so happy they signed him to a two way contract or two year contract. So I think the Lakers need to lock him up and, yeah. So there is that right there for the Lakers. They are currently resting in the ninth spot of the Western Conference, which makes me sad. And what else makes me what else kind of made me sad was yesterday. So yesterday was the two year passing of Kobe Bryant as he as well as eight others, including his daughter Gianna, died in that in that helicopter crash and it was saddening like it was still on my mind for the most part as well as John Altobelli but something weird that happened on that day was that on that day January 26th the Lakers were 24 and 24 and they were in the eighth spot and it had been 24 months since Kobe Bryant passed away I don't know if that is coincidence or or if that's just the Lakers doing that on purpose. Or maybe it's just a sign from Kobe Bryant that the Lakers need to actually freaking play better. Because I actually saw this on a post from one of my friends. He was like, it's it's hard to believe it that it's been two years since you passed, Kobe. I know you're looking down you're on, on the Lakers and you're shaking your head. Miss you, Kobe. And I, I'm paraphrasing, honestly, but he did say that you're probably looking down on the Lakers and shaking your head. So, uh, yep, I do miss him. It was just a hard day yesterday. It was definitely difficult knowing that it had been two years as a Laker fan. Uh, and Larry says he's like, play better, and that's Kobe. So, And he also says, seeing the Lakers lose with a good team makes my blood boil hot enough to burn through my couch as if I were, as I sit on it watching them play. <laughs> well, they have a talent, a good team, yes, but their team is a little aged. Now, if this were like a few years back, I'd say... Yeah, you have every right to burn your couch or make your blood boil to the point where you're burning your couch. But uh, I hope the Lakers can get it together. I feel Anthony Davis coming back will make a big impact. Please prove me right, Anthony Davis. Like, he actually did well tonight against the Sixers. Like, he was going toe-to-toe with Joel Embiid. But unfortunately... The Sixers were able to grind out the win because they're the Philadelphia 76ers and they have a better roster than the Lakers, disappointingly. Well, for now, at least. As Joel Embiid had 26 points, Anthony Davis surprisingly had 31 points. And keep in mind, he was just coming off of this knee injury. He w- he shot 66% from the field, which is impressive. The problem was for the Lakers is that they don't play defense. They gave up 105 points. They gave up 32 in the first quarter. And they gave up 54 in the half altogether. And they gave up 34 points in the third quarter. It's like, goodness gracious, Lakers, why are you doing this to me? The good thing is, is that the Lakers had 20, they got 20 points from Russell Westbrook, but in Russell Westbrook fashion, he had six turnovers and he was minus 11. I really wanted to cringe after that. And then Malik Blanc had 11 points, but unfortunately every player on the team that played had a minus, which was completely disappointing. Anthony Davis's plus minus was minus 7, which wasn't bad. It was actually the third worst of the starters. So there's that. It's disappointing, yes, but It's the Sixers. What can you do? So the Lakers continue their road trip, since I can't really call it the Grammy road trip, as they play the Charlotte Hornets tomorrow. And that's going to actually be a nationally televised game. Something I do need to make note of is that 
Tuesday's game against the, the Nets was to nationally televised. Tonight's game against the Sixers was nationally televised. And then tomorrow's game is also, you guessed it, nationally televised. So everyone is going to be seeing the Lakers or has seen the Lakers more often than not. And then Sunday, the Lakers hit the road to the ATL to take on the Atlanta Hawks. Then the Lakers return home next Wednesday to take on the Portland Trailblazers. And then next Thursday, we have the Lakers playing the Clippers on the road. I say on the road loosely because the Lakers and Clippers share Crypto.com Arena. I'm still trying to get used to calling it the Crypto.com Arena. It will forever be Staples Center. Gosh darn it! <clears throat> anyway, so on to the Clippers. So the Clippers have surprised me in more ways than one. So remember last week when the Clippers made a comeback against the 76ers? They kind of did one again this week as, first of all, back to su- backtracking to Sunday, the Clippers lost to the Knicks 110-102. to 102. They, It felt like they were getting... They were losing by a lot more than just eight points. They were down eight after the first quarter, and they were actually within five at halftime. But unfortunately for the Knicks, because they're the Knicks, they actually they actually played better, and they didn't relinquish this lead, which is disappointing. So it was painful, to say the least, for the Clippers. But honestly... It was kind of expected when it came to the when it came to the Knicks because the Knicks are pretty solid. Then, oh, Tuesday's game. So Tuesday's game against the Wizards. My goodness gracious! This game was so ridiculous. So the Clippers were trailing by as many as thirty-five. They were down sixty-six to thirty-six at halftime. I basically said, "Oof." Yeah, this one is going to end tragically for the Clippers. But they put up a 40-burger in that third quarter, and they're only down 17. I'm like, okay, they're still down 17. Like, the Clippers can't possibly come back from this. Uh, I spoke too soon about that, as the Clippers actually came back from... 35 points down to beat the Wizards as they put up 40 points in the fourth quarter to win 116-115. to 115. I was just in awe. I'm like, how did this happen? It's like the Wizards need to go back to the AAU. Like, that's ridiculous. Giving up a 35-point lead. 35-point lead. This team almost was dumb dumb of the week, but I chose not to because apparently the Wizards are in blow it up mode, even though the record isn't all that terrible. As boy howdy, I, I actually feel bad for for the seven Wizards fans as Luke Kennard hit a three pointer while he got fouled. That's another thing I need to make note of. Why are the Wizards fouling a jump shooter? From downtown! Not only did he make it, he actually made the four-point play free throw, and then the Wizards lost. I think every Wizards fan should get their money back after witnessing that horrible of a collapse. Absolutely disgusting right there. Like, I'm not trying to say the Clippers didn't deserve to win, but boy howdy. You can't lose a 35-point lead. You just can't. <laughs> Wizards don't deserve the playoffs. They don't deserve their team. <laughs> They're currently the 10 seed, but they don't deserve it. Give that 10 seed to the Knicks, please. <laughs> Larry says the Lakers can seriously sign Magic Johnson and Kareem Abdul Jabbar right now in their age and win more games than the current team. <laughs> uh, that, that's pretty funny right there. And yeah, I. I, I totally agree with you on that aspect, Larry. Back to the Clippers. The Clippers defeated the Orlando Magic last night, 111 to 102, which I thought they would have won by a little bit more just because it's the Magic and they stink. But hey, a win's a win. When 
Doc Rivers one time said that it's tough to win the NBA nowadays, and when you're on the road, it kind of, it even more is. Uh, so the Clippers are back in action tomorrow against the Miami Heat. Then they continue their road trip against the Hornets on Sunday, and then they play the Pacers on Monday, and then they return to Staples Center to take on the Lakers in a nationally televised game. And as a Lakers fan, I just really want to see the Lakers actually beat the Clippers. It's kind of been annoying to see the Lakers continue to lose game after game to the Clippers, just because all these rando Clippers fans who are saying, oh, the Clippers own the Lakers, uh, oh, 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 we're the true owners of, of uh, Crypto.com Arena, a.k.a. Staples Center. So... Oh my goodness. So I just want to see the Lakers actually beat the Clippers as a Lakers fan's perspective. It's bad enough the Lakers lost on my birthday to the Clippers, but if they continue to lose to the Clippers, then boy howdy, I won't heal the end of it from the Clippers. And Larry says it best. I he wants to see the Lakers look like the Lakers. I agree. I think the Lakers need to look like the Lakers and not like this. How do I describe this? This retirement home team that needs AAU cards or AARP cards. So what can you do? Clippers schedule gets a little bit more challenging after they take on the Lakers as they have the Bucks the following Sunday, then They have the Grizzlies the following Tuesday, then the Mavericks twice, then the Warriors, then the Suns. And then it kind of gets a little bit light as they play the Rockets, then the Lakers, then the Rockets. Not trying to say the Lakers are light work for the Clippers, but I'm just saying that the Clippers are now, after their road trip, they're going to enter a tough stretch of games where they're basically going to have to prove themselves as the team that made it all the way to the Western Conference Finals last year. So there's that for the Lakers. So jumping on into some college basketball, because I'm actually not going to take any commercial breaks. So jumping into some college basketball, I haven't been really talking too much about the Big West Conference, and I actually feel guilty for not talking about the Big West Conference just because I don't want it to consume this show all too much. But I'm going to say this about the – Big West Conference in men's basketball, it's wide open. It's very wide open. Like, there have been a lot of teams that have been having their ups and downs. In terms of having their ups, however, Cal State Fullerton is currently 5-0. They're only one of two teams that is undefeated in conference play. The other team is Hawaii, which is not in Southern California. But back to Fullerton... They were able to defeat UC Davis on the road tonight, which is quite impressive. Like, considering UC Davis has won a majority of the games as they lead the series, I think 22 to 11, well now 12, it's good to see Cal State Fullerton actually pick up that win on the road and keep that undefeated Big West Conference record alive. So... For Fullerton, they hit the road on Saturday to take on UC Riverside. And if they can actually keep this up, I would be quite impressed to see how they do in the Big West Conference tournament. Like, with how the Big West Conference is a revolving door and how wide open it is, I think any team can win it. Even Davis, disappointingly, and Hawaii. Heck, even Long Beach State can win. Like, Long Beach State is playing decent basketball, even though they're kind of in a little bit of a a rut against, whatchamacallit, uh, UC Riverside. They're actually up four with 329 in the second quarter. So, got to keep an eye on Long Beach State. So, but I just need to make note of uh, the Big West Conference in men's basketball just because it's good to see Cal State Fullerton actually having success. But jumping to everyone's favorite Southern California college men's basketball teams, starting with UCLA. Oh boy, UCLA, I 
was a little surprised that they were able to defeat number three Arizona. I don't know how UCLA did it, but boy howdy, UCLA really, really showed up against Arizona. They won seventy five to fifty nine. They embarrassed Arizona. Like it what was looking like it was gonna be an interesting game on paper turned out to being a complete wash for the Wildcats. As UCLA just straight up manhandled them and it's mainly in the second half. Like Arizona had chances to pull closer. They got the lead down to within seven. But then UCLA just said, Nope, you're not getting that lead. Bye bye, Arizona. So thanks to that win, the Bruins are now in first place in the Pac-12, which is quite nice. It really is nice, as they also beat Cal tonight, which is no surprise, 81-59, to as UCLA is now a half game ahead of Arizona, who plays Arizona State on Saturday, but that's not Southern California. UCLA, on the other hand, plays Stanford at Pauley Pavilion on Saturday as the Bruins will look to try to keep their winning ways going. They've actually won five in a row ever since they lost to the Ducks a couple weeks ago. So good for UCLA. I'm quite impressed. And it was actually 81-57. to I'm giving Cal too much credit. (laughs) So good work for UCLA. I actually saw the game on... On Tuesday against Arizona, I was like, this is the Arizona team that's want, that was able to win three straight games in the Pac-12 by 25-plus points? No. <laughs> Frauds. So, the two actually get to play each other next week as UCLA will be hitting the road to the Cactus State to take on Arizona on Thursday at 5 p.m. I think that's going to be a bit of bit better of a barn burner, especially since the Pac-12 is basically a three-horse race between U- UCLA, Arizona, and USC. For UCLA and Arizona, I think they're going to have much more viewers in this game than they did in the previous game, just because who wants to stay up at 8 p.m. to watch UCLA and Arizona, especially on the East Coast? Like, that is basically disgusting right there. Like, why would they do this to their viewers? Like, why would they they do that? Uh, Viewership deals. What are you going to do at ESPN? As for the other Pac-12 Southern California team, USC, they lead Stanford 34-28 to at halftime. So if everyone remembers, Stanford is one of two teams to defeat USC this year because I don't know what the heck happened to USC in that game. I know there were some questionable calls in the first half against the Trojans, but I will say this about USC – I don't think they should have won that game, but Stanford was hitting practically everything. They were hitting everything, as Cat Williams would say. So, for USC, they were able to reach a milestone last week, as I kind of already explained this, but they beat Colorado for the first time in seven tries, and it actually was Andy Enfield's first win over a Tad Boyle coach team in Colorado. So... Good job, Andy Enfield. There's a reason why Enfield got that extension, which is good stuff. So this matchup against Stanford is very important just because, first of all, I don't want to see Stanford getting swept against Stanford. Second of all, if Stanford Stanford were to beat USC in college men's basketball and football, I think I am going to vomit. (laughs) As a Trojans fan, I don't want to see USC losing to Stanford in men's basketball both times and in football. We would not hear the end of it from all the Stanford fans. So for USC, they just got to hold on when it comes to the second half. Please make your free throws, USC. Boogie Ellis leads the team currently with 11 points, while Drew Peterson and Kobe Johnson 
each have six points. Isaiah Mobley is having a quiet night as he only has five points, but it's the second half. Anything could happen. USC continues their little three-game slate this week as they play Cal at Galen Center on Saturday. I should also make note that USC played Arizona State on Monday, and they pretty much rickrolled them to victory. I think it was like 88-66, to if I'm not mistaken. Uh, 78 to 56. My apologies. Um, I should also make note that USC defeated Utah in their road trip, Rocky Mountain road trip, 79 to 67. As USC, they're still solid. They're number 15 in the nation. It's certainly not as good as being top five, but still, I think USC not being top five takes some of the pressure off of them. But they will have some pressure next week as next week they also will be traveling to the Cactus State to take on Arizona State and Arizona. The main concern is Arizona just because Arizona is freaking good. and It's a Saturday game. The good thing about it is that it's not nationally televised, which is surprising. I thought the Pac – no, not the Pac-12. ESPN or FS1 would nationally televise it. But the fact that we're not getting that nationally televised is kind of puzzling to me. Maybe everyone thought that USC was going to be top 10 or top 5, but unfortunately they fell off because they lost to Stanford and Oregon last, or not last week, a couple weeks ago. And to me, I thought it was rather unexpected, but I would not be surprised to see USC and Arizona flex to prime time. We'll see, though. We'll see. I should, also, I should also make one more note about USC is that they will be playing UCLA not next Saturday, but the following Saturday. And that will be played at Galen Center, which should be quite nice. I think it's going to be a fun little matchup between UCLA and USC. And we'll see if the Trojans can keep up their winning streak against the Bruins. It's going to be tough considering Mick Cronin knows what he's doing when it comes to UCLA. On the topic of basketball news, I should make note that LeBron James made history tonight as he actually, despite him not playing tonight, he actually was voted to his 18th consecutive All-Star game. And there is not another player that has been named to the All-Star game 18 consecutive times. So for LeBron to do that, it's quite impressive. So good job, King. I am very proud of you, and I, even though you haven't really been on the Lakers all that much, it's good to see you continuing to do your thing, buddy. So, good job, King James. Now, without any further delay, let's get on into the Dum Dum of the Week Award recipient. So, the Dum Dum of the Week Award goes out to a person or organization that does something stupid and it doesn't even have to be limited to Southern California. It could be anywhere in the world. Like at no, no one, no person is safe from the dumb, dumb of the week award as I can pretty much give it to anyone. I can give it to my neighbor's dog. I can give it to a crow that poops on me. I can give it to anybody. So I actually have two dumb, dumb of the week awards to give out. So the first one, we're actually going to travel back in time a little bit. And before I actually continue with the Dum Dum of the Week award, I actually should make a little bit of a correction from the second Dum Dum of the Week award recipient this calendar year as the officers that got fired from playing Pokemon Go did not play it this year. They played it all the way back in in the past as it was back when Pokemon Go was still a thing that they just unfortunately did not get reimbursed or they did not get the charges dropped for playing Pokemon Go while on the job. I still think that is probably po- Dum Dum of the Year right there. So they can't really be a legitimate candidate for Dum Dum of the Year, but I still think it's very dumb that the police officers that were playing Pokemon Go while on patrol did that sort of thing. And they thought they were going to get off scot free and they were going to get a second chance or whatnot. No. So now we jump to the Dum Dum of the Week award for this week. So the two Dum Dums of the Week award have to do with the NFL. 
Oh my goodness. So this one isn't as big as the other one, but it's makes me scratch my head quite a bit. So this happened in the Niners Packers game. And I just could not believe what happened in the last drive for the 49ers. So the Niners were eventually were able to drive down the field. They were able to get Robbie Gould into decent field goal range. And then before all that happened, the Packers took a timeout. I guess they wanted to ice Robbie Gould. So the Packers and Niners eventually made their way out onto the field. And then the Packers were able to not get the field goal blocked as Robbie Gould kicked it through the uprights and it was good. So obviously the Packers losing is not the dumb dumb of the week award, but on that final sequence where the Packers were on their special teams trying to block the game, the potential game winning field goal or the game winning field goal, the Packers coming out of that timeout only had 10 players on defense. The Packers had 10 players on defense when it came to trying to block that field goal coming out of a timeout. How does that happen? I can't believe what I just witnessed. It's like uh, 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 10 people? You're supposed to have 11. My goodness. I'm surprised Robbie Gould didn't miss the kick. And then the referees pulled out the flag and said... Not enough men on the field. Defense. Five-yard penalty. Replay the kick. I'm surprised that didn't happen. I'm surprised the Packers didn't get flagged for that. But instead, they just had didn't have enough players when it came to trying to block the kick. And eventually, they wound up losing. I understand things can happen. I understand confusion happens. But after a timeout, you only have 10 players on the field when you're trying to block the field goal and save your season? My gosh, Green Bay, you don't deserve to advance to the next round. You deserve to go to Cancun. I'm sorry, but that is ridiculous having 10 players on the field. Your special teams is the definition of not so special. Your special teams makes the Chargers special teams look sane. That was unacceptable. I understand wins and losses happening, but how do you mess that up after a timeout? Disgusting right there. What are you doing, Matt LaFleur? Whoever your special teams coach is, Green Bay, fire him immediately. You are this week's Dumb Dumb of the Week Award recipient number one. That's so dumb. You are really dumb. For real. <laughs> and that is Dum Dum of the Week Award recipient number one. Now for Dum Dum of the Week Award recipient number two. Oh boy. So this one is a lot more ridiculous. So this one actually does reside in Southern California. And this one actually goes to an organization, another organization. So everyone knows that the Niners-Rams game is going to be lit. It's going to have a lot of fans, and most likely it's going to be filled with Niners fans. Cool stuff. What, What transpired before the NFC Divisional Round game between the Bucks and the Rams was that, I don't know who it was, I think it was like the city of Los Angeles or something along those lines or whoever owns SoFi, whoever it was when it came to the concerns of Los Angeles or whoever made the concern about SoFi being invaded with Niners fans, I could not believe what I saw that day. It's like, first of all, why are we concerned over the Rams currently? And here's something you need to know. So, important event info. This was released by 
SoFi Stadium. Public sales to the game at SoFi Stadium in Inglewood, California will be restricted to the residents of the greater Los Angeles region. Regency will be based on credit card billing address at checkout. Orders by residents outside of the greater area region will be canceled without notice and get refunds given. Let me say that again. Orders by residents outside of the greater Los Angeles region will be canceled without notice and refunds given. Are we kidding me right now? What is this garbage? First of all, how is this legal? How is this allowed? How is this... You can't just do that. You can't just block off other people from purchasing tickets to the game. What if Rams fans live in the Bay Area or New Jersey or wherever they're coming from and they have to buy tickets from other regions? Like, what happens then? You can't just limit games to just Los Angeles. It's ridiculous. I could not believe this news. It's like, what? What I also couldn't believe was that they put the game out there or they put the news out there before the NFC Championship began. It's like, shouldn't you really make plans for the NFC Championship game on your home turf before the championship game or or, or after the divisional round? Like, shouldn't you, like, make plans to have the NFC Championship game after you win the divisional round? Because if the Rams had lost to the Bucks, like, let's say that actually happens, that would have been super awkward to propose that statement only for the Rams to lose to the Bucks. But they didn't. The Rams were able to win. But to see that statement, to block off other people outside of the greater Los Angeles area... I was astounded. I, even as a Southern California fan, was just in awe. I was just flabbergasted. I was like, uh, 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 uh." like, how is that even legal? It's like, it makes zero sense. It only hurts ticket prices. Now, eventually the blockage was lifted, but It's really stupid that SoFi or whoever did that proposed that idea. All because they were concerned about Niners fans taking over. You're that concerned? The Chargers would never do that. But the Rams are doing that or whoever SoFi is working for. Regardless, it's disappointing. I just could not believe that news. I almost want to puke after seeing that. You can't just block off residents like that just because or ticket sales people just because they don't live in los angeles oh my god i just couldn't believe it (laughs) and then eventually they we even had freaking andrew whitworth's wife buying tickets and saying don't go selling your tickets to niners fans and kelly stafford the wife of matt stafford or matthew stafford She said, I'm going to buy a lot of Rams tickets for Rams fans or veterans or seasonal work or healthcare workers or any of that sort. And then I'm just going to give them out to you as long as you DM me. Oh my God, I can't believe it's coming down to this. I I can't believe it's coming down just because everyone is concerned about Niners fans taking over. It's like, again... Games are won on the field and not in the stands. Please do me a favor and just let it be. Like, if you have to play in front of Niners fans, so be it. Now you know what the Chargers go through. And whoever made that statement, whoever forced that little rule of Los Angeles fans will be able to purchase the tickets for the NFC Championship game and not anyone outside of the Los Angeles district you are this week's Dum Dum of the Ward recipient number two. Whoever you are, whether you're working with SoFi, whether you're working with SoFi Stadium, whether you're working with the Rams, it doesn't matter. You are Dum Dum of the Week Award recipient number two.
so dumb. You are really dumb, for real. <laughs> And that, my friends, is all she wrote. Oh my god, these Dumb Dumb of the Week Award recipients are getting ridiculous by the by the week. But that's the beauty of it. It's Shackton the Fool without the Shackton. So... Before I lose my sanity even more, that is going to do it for this week's episode of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. For those of you that tuned in this late at night, I know if you're on the East Coast, it's midnight. I really do appreciate you. Without any further delay, let's get on out of here, because I got me a big day tomorrow in terms of work and volleyball. Yiddig! Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. I really do appreciate you all tuning in. I'm sorry if I had to have the SoCal Supreme Sports Show this late at night. I promise you this will not be a regular basis. I promise you all I will have this in, like, the afternoon, late evening at best, or early evening at best. If you listen live, I appreciate you. If you listen on the playback, I appreciate you. If you listen in the wee hours of the morning, I appreciate you. And if you listen at work, I appreciate you. Big shout out to my boy, Larry B, for tuning in. I really do appreciate you and all the work you do for IE Sports Radio. I'm excited for 3 and Out College Edition this weekend. It's going to be a fun time, and I can't wait for it. For everyone here at IE Sports Radio, this is Tara Rodriguez signing off. Good morning to everyone on the East Coast. Good night to everyone on the West Coast. Have yourselves an amazing weekend. Don't do anything stupid. Don't do anything that'll get you Dumb Dumb of the Week award. And I will see you tomorrow at Long Beach State. Keep an eye on Set Points Twitter account for updates on the Long Beach State men's volleyball matches. You all have yourselves a great weekend. And remember, SoCal is for show, Cal. Peace!